Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining uh, our fourth uh, health security dialogue. Uh, hosted by Global Health uh, Policy Innovation Policy Program, GHIPP, at GRIPS. Uh, my name is Hiromi Murakami, and I'm with GHIPP, and I'll be facilitating this uh, dialogue series. We are very honored to welcome a distinguished guest today from Geneva, and Dr. Osamu Kuni of the Global Fund uh, in this very important timing. The Japanese government, as you well know, that had just declared a state of emergency last week for a second time, and then we continue to face unforeseeable future. And the purpose of this dialogue series is to build a community where we can share uh, knowledge, experience, and to discuss how to best prepare for the future crisis and build a health resilience. In the past week, we have seen some nations uh, have started vaccinations, but still majority of nations in the world are still struggling with the situation, including Japan. And there is a multilateral framework, which is called COVAX facility, um, is, is in place to provide vaccines for lower uh, and the lower income, middle income countries. And we'd like to hear more about how international community can um, deal with this pandemic. And Dr. Kuni will be sharing his view regarding um, global solidarity to end COVID-19 pandemic progress and challenges. We have a dialogue and Q&A uh, following the, uh, Dr. Kuni's talk. And also Dr. Kurokawa will be sharing his view afterwards. For administrative announcement, if you have any questions, please uh, submit your questions in the Q&A um, column on the bottom of your screen so that we can, uh, facilitator or uh, the speakers can pick up your questions during the discussion. And let me uh, introduce today's speaker, Dr. Osamu Kuni. He is the head of strategy, investment and impact division of the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. He is managing five departments, namely strategic information, technical adv advice and partnership, health finance and community, rights and gender, and access to funding. He has over 25 years of experience in global health, especially maternal and child health, infectious disease control, health systems, health policy and diplomacy by serving in various posts, such as Deputy Director of Aid Planning Division in the Japan Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Professor of Global Health at Nagasaki University, Research Institute of Tropical Medicine, Senior Advisor at UNICEF Headquarters, Chief of Health and Child Survival Program in UNICEF Myanmar and Somalia. And we have Dr. Kiyoshi Kurokawa from GRIPS as a commentator, and he is a professor uh, emeritus directing GHIPP, as he has long been involved in this global health arena, has substantial knowledge about this re realm. He is a member of World Dementia Council, International Scientific Advisory Committee, and many other academic institutions. With that, I'd like to pass microphone to Dr. Kuni, and we very much appreciate that uh, you are sharing your views with us. Thank you very much and all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. murakami and also uh, Dr. Kuroka-sensei. Um, okay, so today I now, um, can you see my screen and also uh, at the first page of uh, slide, right? Okay, that's great. Okay, so good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. I'm very much pleased to be here and uh, give a kind of lecture webinar. And today I'm going to talk about uh, this global solidarity to end the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so uh, it is full screen. Can you see in the full screen? Okay, great. And now second screen, could you see or not? Okay, good. So I'm talking about uh, global situation of COVID-19 pandemic and global response, its progress and challenge and toward ending epidemics. Okay, so, uh, 
So now, uh, as you know, that uh, new cases and deaths are increasing some of the countries exponentially, okay? Maybe some of the countries are, are really kind of facing second wave or third wave. And uh, yeah, actually the, this daily death by regions quite large in uh, Europe. It, Europe is now facing second or third wave, kind of, uh, you know, the most of the countries in Europe are really kind of suffering from those, uh, you know, the many cases and death. And uh, still uh, US and the North America has a lot of cases and death and even Latin America. And Asia, especially uh, Southern uh, continent of uh, Asia also are suffering from death and the cases of COVID. So Japan, uh, as all of you know, that uh, also facing very big wave and uh, state of emergency are now issued and uh, you are, you know, who are living in Japan every day, you are really kind of suffering from a lot of uh, kind of uh, bottlenecks of this one. And currently I'm now uh, living in Switzerland, Geneva, and even this uh, Switzerland has uh, one tenth, less than one tenth of Jap Japanese uh, population. This total case is uh, almost uh, much uh, higher than Japan and total deaths are also kind of double. And uh, uh, we have, you know, even sec first uh, wave, you can see in March or April, we really kind of, uh, you know, suffering from a daily uh, increase, almost exponential, you know, the increase of cases. And that uh, we lock down and uh, we close our uh, office and uh, started our uh, the homework. But now this second wave, third wave we call, is a much, much, much higher than this first wave. You can see, you know, this first wave is very small, but uh, as I said, it was a really kind of big, uh, really kind of big suffering. But now this second wave is really, you know, uh, huge. So uh, uh, most of the hospitals in Geneva, full of patients. So they have no capacity to accept the, you know, the new cases, or new uh, patients. So uh, they are uh, transferring the patients to other canton, other you know, places. And France adjacent to uh, Switzerland, also uh, really kind of suffering. Uh, now kind of subsided, but still uh, quite a lot of cases. Uh, it is a sixth uh, in terms of the total number of uh, cases. US, it is a first. As you know, US has a CDC, Center for Disease Control and Prevention. So, and also uh, USA ranked first as a um, uh, country prepared for pandemic, according to the Johns Hopkins and other uh, global health security index in the past. It is a report in 19, uh, 20, uh, 2019, but finally this become the kind of a worst, you know, the, um, in terms of uh, this COVID uh, uh, pandemic, 23 million you know, cases and total deaths is uh, uh, almost 400,000 uh, 400, cases, uh, the death. UK, it is fifth. As you know, the variant is uh, uh, predominant now uh, in U UK and uh, total deaths, e even first wave, they had a huge, you know, the toll of uh, death but the second wave, they also couldn't, uh, you know, prevent. So um, the Prime Minister Boris, uh, Boris Johnson said, now this uh, pandemic is, and epidemic is out of control. It's so difficult for them, even, you know, using lockdown. Germany, uh, as country of success in a first wave, but now you can see here, so huge wave, almost exponential. Uh, especially in terms of death. Actually, the Germany could, you know, suppress, um, minimize, I, I can say minimize that death compared to other European countries in the first wave. But second wave, it is very, very difficult to suppress. Uh, for example, this is Japan, uh, Germany's lockdown rule. So uh, private meetings limit just only one person uh, from uh, other household. 
and uh, you know parents uh, could get uh, extra 10 days leave to look after children and the single parents uh, could get uh, 20 days for you know looking after children um, and uh, residents in areas with more than 200 cases per 10 hundred thousands can be restricted from travelers more than 15 kilometers and also uh, set the quarantine arriving in Germany from high risk areas submit two negative tests to result within five days quarantine between tests. So, you know, each country are kind of um, uh, uh, providing specific measures and the stricter uh, lockdown uh, and trying to suppress this, uh, you know, the huge wave of uh, second or third wave of uh, epidemic. If you look at the middle or low income countries, also uh, really kind of suffering from this uh, 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 the epidemics. Actually, India, it is not wave because, you know, big wave uh, already, you know, uh, hitting India. And uh, it is incredible because of daily case become a hundred K just in a single country. Could you imagine? And even death, you know, uh, almost uh, 10,000 deaths every day. So it is kind of a huge, you know, that uh, 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 event in this uh, India. And South Africa, it is, you know, uh, even Africa also uh, uh, gets this uh, epidemics. And South Africa is now the second wave and uh, still exponential increase is happening. Zambia, uh, you can see it is also a um, real big increase in a second wave. Tanzania, this is a country with population uh, are almost half of uh, you know, Japan, uh, around the 58 million, and the land is 1.5 times larger than Japan. And you can see this is only 509 cases. So can you see this is a country of success? No, actually president stopped reporting the cases of COVID. Can you imagine that, uh, you know, the president decided we shouldn't count this, uh, you know, COVID because it gives, uh, you know, so much threat. And there's no cases in uh, COVID here in this Tanzania. So many of my friends are working inside of the Tanzania and they said to me that even, you know, the meeting of for COVID, uh, that person, you know, he's, uh, you know, the expatriate and he wear mask, but uh, minister mentioned that there's no COVID. So there's no uh, need to be afraid of this COVID. So, uh, you know, they have to, you know, take off the, their the masks for the meeting. Maybe it's a quite, uh, you know, uh, COVID is also rampant in this Tanzania, but there is no way to uh, measure. There are many, you know, African countries and other low-income countries uh, which are kind of lack of um, uh, laboratory and testing. So uh, still, you know, we do not know uh, which countries are really kind of under uh, big waves and uh, which waves of the you know, epidemic. So even reported cases, we could see the second big wave of uh, uh, the COVID epidemic in Africa, but maybe the real situation of these uh, uh, numbers could be several times, you know, as many as reported cases. So now that the annual death, uh, oh sorry, that the COVID-19, the daily death is almost 15,000. And uh, now the total annual death of COVID-19 is the first and top cause of death among uh, infectious diseases. Actually in the past, the TB, tuberculosis was a, a top cause of death among uh, pathogens, but now the COVID-19 exceeding. And, but still this uh, instance or cases, uh, of course, you know, reported cases are maybe underestimated, 
because there are a lot of uh, unreported cases. But still, Madedi has much more. Madedi has um, more than 200 million cases per year. And if you look at the latent tuberculosis, it is 1.7 billion. Of course, latent TB is no uh, uh, symptomatic, but uh, you know later it could show that the uh, symptom. So uh, still, lots of uh, you know pathogens are around. As you know, we have uh, more than a uh, thousand pathogens, uh, you know, for humans, and uh, still, you know, there are a lot of kind of emerging diseases uh, as an infection. But uh, you know, the COVID nineteen is one of the, those pathogens, but of course that it is really kind of dreadful. And uh, some of the countries, uh, you know, antibody positivity, it's very much increased. This is case of Manaus. Uh, currently over 70% of the populations are uh, antibody, COVID-19 antibody positive, meaning maybe Herd natural herd immunity could be quite difficult to be set up. So uh, yeah, let's see. But uh, you know, there are some of the uh, places uh, already. You know, this antibody is over fifty percent of the population. This is a case of uh, the Manaus uh, extending the graveyard because uh, you know daily so many uh, deaths are you know added. So uh, they needed to extend their graveyard. This picture really kind of reminded me of the days of uh, HIV in Africa, 1980s, 90s. You know, at the time they didn't know they are uh, those deaths. You know, the exponentially uh, happening are by HIV because initially they called us slim diseases with without knowing or diagnosing many you know the people especially at the reproductive ages are dying so uh, if you look at the like expectancy the hiv really kind of impacted the you know rapid drop of life expectancy and some of the countries lost the uh, lifespan more than 10 years actually this time uh, the covid uh, influenced uh, this uh, drop of life expectancy just around one or two years. Even Brazil, it is a one year. Uh, meaning, uh, because, you know, as you know, pre if you look, look at the premature death, maybe COVID is uh, not so much influencing because uh, COVID really hit uh, the people in the elderly, you know, among elderly. So uh, usually the loss of, uh, you know, expectancy could be maybe uh, minimized. But anyway, um, and uh, if you look at the fatality and uh, infectivity in terms of, uh, you know, basic reproduct uh, reproduction num numbers and also uh, uh, infection fatality risks, actually there are many other pathogens uh, much, you know, severe uh, in this, in terms of fatality and the infectivity, for example, HIV uh, was passed. Said that uh, you know the mortality is almost over ninety five percent, and the measles, you know, it has a very very high infectivity. When I look at, at uh, you know one case of measles in a refugee camp in Africa and others, I was so so scared because it spread very very rapidly and uh, uh, increased at the mortality especially under five. But why is this COVID-19 uh, such a threat? Because, uh, you know, they said, this is a master of deceiving or hit and run killers. Because, you know, this uh, uh, spread, uh, this, this virus is spreading even without the symptoms. So it's sneaking in the, the medical, you know, facilities and the elderly facilities. So, uh, you know, it's really kind of uh, sneaking and uh, deceiving, you know, the people and uh, underestimate severity and uh, many e e premiers present and the, um, the prime ministers also said, okay, this is just flu, you know. 
because you know even young stars even get uh, uh, infected, not so serious. So, uh, uh, you know, while people are underestimating this severity, it's really kind of spreading. But it also shows that the rapid change uh, of, uh, you know, the stage clinical uh, features into a serious stages. So they show that the very, very unique uh, clinical features of a sensitive ear, blood clotting, and overdriving that the immune system. So, uh, you, you know, the clinicians yeah, told me that we is really kind of uh, never uh, experienced in such a uh, very rapid and sudden change of the, uh, the situation, clinical symptoms. And it's really kind of severe and very, very difficult to, to treat, they said. But of course, that the COVID uh, also uh, impact directly or indirectly other uh, areas like economy, as you know, that already uh, countries spent uh, more than 18 trillion, you know, US dollar for uh, COVID measures of COVID, but uh, we lose another, you know, the 12 trillion by the end of 2021. So even compared to the Lehman shock uh, and great um, the loss of this uh, uh, economic recession, uh, this year and last year and this year would be seen as a really, you know, big drop in terms of GDP and the growth uh, of the economy. And of course, uh, this uh, COVID or indirect, uh, you know, impact by COVID, meaning special lockdown, uh, give a big uh, you know, impact on poverty, education, gender issues, and others. For example, push 150 million people to extreme poverty and 135 million to severe hunger and starvation. That is why WFP is also working very hard to reach out to the, those who are uh, suffering from, uh, you know, the starvation and hunger. And uh, because of the school closures, 1.5 billion children are affected in 160 countries. This would, of course, uh, give a uh, short term, but at the same time, long term effect on child growth and, uh, you know, kind of mentality as well. And, uh, you know, this COVID pandemic is also called the shadow pandemic of uh, gender violence or uh, intimate patterns violence. And uh, some of the countries observe uh, some uh, girls and the women missing, maybe because of, uh, you know, domestic violence and others. And uh, this COVID really broadened the inequity. Uh, so uh, you can see uh, ethnic, some of the ethnic groups or migrants in Europe and other, uh, even the US also uh, uh, had the uh, inequitable, you know, the result of COVID in terms of uh, infectivity and also uh, mortality as well. Uh, you know, this equity is very, very critical. So in my uh, organization, Global Fund, we also uh, uh, support this inequity by uh, making data, disaggregated data available we have, uh, you know, six dimensions of inequity, ethnicity, income, location, education, gender, and ages. So uh, we really need to generate that disaggregated uh, data uh, for all this equity so that we could reach out to the people who are really, uh, you know, suffering from uh, this um, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. This is kind of an example, that's a gender inequity, that 70% of the health and the social care workforce are female, so uh, they are more kind of uh, uh, likely to get infected with HIV, uh, sorry, that's uh, uh, COVID. And, you know, lockdown, um, many, many countries uh, really imposed this lockdown. And this lockdown really disrupted a lot of um, you know health programs, even immunizations, and HIV, e ART provision, detection and treatment of uh, tuberculosis, 
and the bed net campaigns, etc. So oh, this lockdown really decreased the TB case notification, diagnosis, and also a treatment. And uh, uh, WHO, UNAs, and other you know technical partners uh, made um, kind of modeling of uh, this disruption by lockdown and other COVID uh, uh, indirect and direct uh, uh, impact. And they concluded that uh, maybe HIV and the malaria death would be doubled. And tuberculosis also add a lot of, uh, you know, that death. And uh, maybe we'll lose the progress in the past of uh, 10 years or 20 years. Uh, so even we Global Fund usually dealing with uh, three diseases, but we had to work and combat this uh, COVID because we are the largest multi uh, finance here for global health and the money is available uh, in country. So we try to be flexible to use those of money for COVID because a lot of disruption of uh, HIV, TB, malaria, uh, you know, the programs as well. And we have a good, good experience to uh, fight against infectious diseases. And uh, you know, mostly testing, tra uh, tracking, and test uh, treating, and the human rights issues like discrimination of uh, COVID patients or health workers, and the community-based approaches quite similar. So um, uh, we could utilize this experience for COVID as well. And we are quite good at the strengthening the laboratory and the procurement supply chains. So we uh, made um, most of our experience and our partners. Uh, for this COVID one. We have a great partnership at global, regional, and country level, not just only with government, but also an international organization, a UN organizations, NGO, private sectors, and civil societies. So we, you know, mobilize and leverage the resources for this COVID. So what we have done is, uh, you know, rapid and flexible and at scale support. So we mobilized our own resources and also additional resources of 1 billion US dollar. And we already uh, provided uh, to 160, uh, 106 countries and 14 multi-country grants. So, uh, you know, in this kind of crisis, the rapidness and the swift action is very, very critical. Uh, you know, sometimes, uh, UN or international uh, organization and arenas, bit kind of slow in motion. Um, you know, we have a lot of, you know, meeting and discussion, but we really need to move into the action. So uh, this time we use that our grant flexibility, uh, reprogramming or repurposing our uh, money for COVID uh, and combat, combat with COVID within three days. So uh, anyway, we need to assure kind of, uh, uh, and also uh, uh, need to, uh, you know, well manage that uh, uh, financial uh, things. So uh, we need to assure that the financial, uh, the management. So we invited that kind of um, the reprogramming and repurposing from countries, and we had to review and approve uh, process. But we did that review and approval within three days. And for COVID-19 response mechanisms, it is kind of new uh, money and uh, a new uh, application, uh, but we also reviewed and approved within 10 days. So uh, we supported a variety of uh, NGOs and civil societies to help uh, testing of COVID and uh, treating COVID or isolation uh, at the community level. We supported diagnostics and PPE, you know, uh, personal protective equipment and the therapeutics, especially oxygen and others. And of course, you know, we need global collaboration solidarities because it is huge programs. So a single, you know, agency could not uh, deal with. So uh, uh, mainly the nine international organizations and philanthropy, including um, Gates Foundation, WHO, 
uh, Global Fund, and etc., uh, gathered, and we made uh, access to COVID-19 to accelerator. We call ACTA, and we made uh, three pillars: vaccine, therapeutics, diagnostics, and we tried to connect the three by uh, health sector system connectors. Uh, almost daily meeting initially, and um, nowadays a weekly meetings we have among these, uh, you know, main uh, partners and uh, we discuss. You know, in this kind of, uh, you know, global collaboration, we need uh, several steps, but uh, setting target, uh, we set the two billions uh, to, you know, uh, provide vaccines, 245 million uh, providing new therapeutics, and the 500 millions uh, to provide a diagnostics by mid 2021 or end 2020. So we usually set target and uh, we calculated and we uh, set the target of uh, 38 billion uh, US dollar for this uh, ACTA. But uh, so far we got a pledge around uh, uh, five or six billion. So uh, still, you know, lacking. So this is Global Health Campus. Uh, nowadays, even physically, we gathered. So Global Fund, Gavi, Unitaid, and others are uh, now, um, you know, staying in this uh, uh, new campus. But of course, now this is closed, and we are now uh, staying and working at home. And this uh, ACTA uh, has is not just a uh, um, stimulating R and D, that research and uh, development, but also um, market shaping, manufacturing, and a very swift uh, procurement and demand generation and uh, in-country deliver, uh, delivery. So as I said, uh, this kind of uh, you know, glo global solidarity and effort and collaboration needs initially that the goal and target setting and uh, need to exercise the investment case using uh, you know, the mathematical modeling and scenario setting and cost analysis. And we set the target, and uh, we calculate that uh, uh, the budget uh, in need, and uh, we of course uh, need uh, resource mobilization and implemented monitoring. Uh, in this kind of a very uh, urgent situation, we need to do these steps, not step by step, but at the same time. Then you know several steps at the same time. Okay, so far we made a quite good progress. Uh, new uh, two new RDT, the rapid diagnostic test, are uh, developed and approved, and uh, we had a kind of a performance on the evaluation, and uh, yeah, a lot of things. And so far, we already procured and start distribution twenty-seven million molecular tests and the twelve million rapid antigen tests. Uh, yeah, maybe I want to skip this, but uh, we also need uh, you know training. So we had uh, online training or uh, yeah, deliver for the 23,000 participants or health workers uh, for this. As you know, we need to protect the health workers because they are really kind of frontline workers and fighters for this COVID. But we initially have to protect them by uh, a personal pro uh, the protective uh, equipment and also need to provide uh, you know good proper training for this and fortunately uh, we already distributed this automated PCR testing for TB and malaria and this uh, the automated uh, the testing could be used for COVID by developing this small cartilage. Actually, this is a small cartilage. It's a bit uh, more expensive than uh, TB and the HIV-1, but uh, still they provided 20 US dollar per cartridge. And it is very fast, just only one hour. It, this is the PCR test, but uh, just only it take one hour uh, for showing that the result. And the right side is an antigen rapid test. Uh, we all, all already procured so so many you know the, uh, tests, and we have now the two tests, um, just only fifteen minutes uh, to show that the result, and uh, cost uh, it costs just only five dollar, or less than five dollar per test, very very cheap. 
Okay, if vaccine pillar, <laughs> most of the people are very much interested in this uh, vaccine pillar. We call uh, you know the, this vaccine pillar and also COVAX facilities uh, you know, created by Gavi and also CEPI. CEPI is a coalition for epidemic preparedness and innovation. This CEPI was created in the uh, World Economic Forum several years ago. And it is also a private public partnership for uh, stimulating R&D and the procurement of uh, you know, new vaccines. And yeah, so this is kind of platform to support R&D and the manufacturing and the procurement and negotiating uh, pricing. And as you know, uh, as of uh, 12 uh, January, we have uh, 63 uh, the, you know, vaccine candidates in clinical stage and uh, 173 preclinical stages. And usually quite difficult to, uh, to you know, find a vaccine, even more than 30 years of uh, uh, research and development. There's no malaria uh, vaccine, there's no HIV vaccine, but surprisingly, this COVID vaccine is almost, you know, developed within one year. It is really amazing. Uh, but this COVAX tried to reduce that uh, risk uh, of this uh, uh, R&T. So uh, they include nine candidates for this COVAX. And COVAX uh, includes that advanced market commitment. It is kind of innovative financing. We try to collect and mobilize resources, money in advance, and try to utilize those for uh, R and T and uh, you know all procurement and manufacturing, etc. And uh, finally, they raise at uh, two billion US dollar for this, and uh, uh, ninety four higher income countries, including Japan, uh, yeah, other you know G seven G seven countries, but not US, except the US, join this Covax facilities and supporting 92 low and middle income countries. Now, as you know, the quite effective vaccines are available, Oxford and AstraZeneca, uh, Pfizer, Moderna, and others. But actually it is not so easy. You know that the uh, uh, effective vaccine developed is not the end of the game. I've been working for, uh, you know, the EPI, the, the expanded uh, the immunization program in Africa and other countries. Even I, I was working in UNICEF headquarters in New York for this vaccine vaccination. But we have now, for example, 97% of efficacies of a vaccine is measles vaccine. Yeah. And we have been working for measles uh, for several decades, but still, we could not eradicate or eliminate, even control these measles. As you know, even in Japan, sometimes you, you have an outbreak of uh, measles. Very, very difficult to you know, really kind of eliminate one of the diseases, okay? And uh, you know, how to uh, distribute, allocate and distribute these vaccines because uh, you know, the manufacturing capacity is limited food prioritize for shot and the logistics also very difficult. One of the uh, vaccine need the cold chain less uh, around the minus 70 you know, degrees Celsius. Even you know ordinary uh, the cold chain, uh, the vaccines need the cold chain uh, less than eight uh, degrees Celsius. So uh, you know when I was working in, in Somalia and other African countries, uh, one of my uh, uh, work is the logistics, you know, how to send the vaccine last mile to the very, very remote area. So uh, like you see, you know, the, in this uh, uh, photo at the right side, this kind of, you know, uh, health worker has to bring uh, this uh, vaccine several, sometimes several hours in a very, very hot uh, semi-desert zone and have to give the shot. So, uh, you know, this logistics is very hard. Of course, adverse effects, students do not know. Uh, even they evaluated adverse effect in this uh, clinical trial, but uh, usually we do not know because sometimes, you know, that the, uh, after mass camp, uh, the immunization, we 
come to know that uh, you know the, some of the adverse effect. Of course, m vaccine hesitancy is still huge. So some of the countries may uh, uh, turn down this uh, vaccine shot, even available more than 40% of the population or sometimes more than 50%. So uh, a lot of uh, discussion. Um, many rich countries already or now securing that um, uh, vaccine by bilateral negotiation with manufacturers. U UK has uh, uh, already contract or agreement with uh, factors, manufacturers, several manufacturers, uh, even the covering whole population. And uh, Japan, uh, also you, you are making so much kind of effort for that securing. So I understand, you know, such kind of um, uh, the countries uh, kind of efforts because uh, they really need to uh, protect their own na national people. But, uh, you know, uh, if we leave those kind of effort as it is, uh, you know, poor countries could not get access to this limited number of um, the vaccines. And, uh, you know, if you uh, analyze um, that kind of allocation, if, you know, the vaccines distributed only to high income countries, only 33% uh, of deaths could be averted. But if you allocate uh, these vaccines, limited number of vaccines to all the countries, even including poor countries or low income countries, 61% of death could be averted in the world. And uh, even the rich countries are protected. And if not, that uh, uh, low income countries populations are not uh, you know, protected, you know, this COVID could not be ending, right? Because, uh, you know, that uh, uh, pathogen would not respect the border. So, uh, you know, this is not a matter of uh, only rich countries, but um, whole nations. Um, so vaccine allocation, usually the allocation model is very, very difficult. You know, we have um, also kind of uh, uh, the allocation and investment case. So at the time of allocation, it's very, very hard to developing that allocation model using GNI and, uh, you know, that disease burden and some of the key populations, you know, distribution, et cetera, but very, very difficult. So now that there are some uh, uh, debates between proportional allocation or a fair priority, uh, priority model. So current COVAX, uh, you know, is planning to have a proportional allocation. So initially 3% of uh, populations in all the countries to be provided, you know, uh, the vaccine provided to 3% uh, of population initially. And second phase is, uh, you know, increasing to 20% to high risk groups. So initial uh, protected populations are uh, high, uh, you know, health personnel or elderies and uh, going to be a kind of high risk. But uh, uh, other, uh, you know, the experts really show that maybe better to give uh, this allocation of uh, vaccines uh, according to that the fair priority model, uh, maybe looking at uh, premature death or social economic factors or community spreads. Uh, let's see how, you know, the SAGE group uh, in WHO would provide that uh, uh, the suggestion for this uh, allocation. But anyway, now it's very, this is a kind of hot um, a topic, how to uh, allocate the limited number of uh, vaccine. This is a really kind of a public health ethical issues. Okay, so uh, uh, we don't have enough budget for purchasing and distributing this uh, even vaccine. And as I, you, you see that, uh, uh, diagnostics and the new uh, treatment, if available, also uh, are quite difficult to uh, uh, distribute to low-income countries. That is why we are now seeking that variety of uh, other options of innovative financing. Anyway, I want to skip there, but uh, you need to look at variety of um, innovative financing like loan buy down, uh, debt swap and etc. Uh, mainly we are now discussing with uh, uh, World Bank. Actually, uh, in my division in the Global Fund, we set up a new department in my division. It is health finance department because this uh, financing is very critical in this um, new era of uh, COVID because uh, all the countries are suffering from their own 
you know, budgeting and uh, the uh, financial resources. And we, we need to, you know, mobilize domestic resources and also uh, innovative way of um, finding financing. Okay, so uh, where to go? So maybe there are several scenarios for ending epidemics. One is eradication and the other one elimination control. Maybe many of uh, the you experts know that uh, difference, uh, the difference of these uh, uh, you know, three terms. Eradication, as you know, uh, we need to know that eradicability. So uh, there are some, some conditions, very clear uh, and also effective diagnostics testing uh, and also uh, quite uh, you know, evident uh, the symptoms and non reservoir uh, you know, other than human. So we only succeeded in uh, smallpox eradication, but no others. Uh, you know, many other pathogens are also tried for eradication, like polio, guinea worm, uh, malaria, yellow fever, etc. But it was quite difficult. Of course, now the polio and guinea worm are quite uh, under uh, control, and also going to be elimination, but uh, uh, quite hard. And the elimination. Uh, already, you know, we have done uh, so much kind of effort for lymphatic filariasis, leprosy, and etc. But the elimination is also quite a difficult. Contrary is kind of a possible potential one, but um, uh, you know, we need to look at kind of a, a measures. So we usually, you know, set the kind of target for uh, ending epidemics, and we set a very clear target uh, for HIV, TB, malaria. And, but, you know, the looking at, uh, you know, target by 2030, it's very, very big gap between, uh, you know, our current trajectory and, uh, you know, the real target. So what I want to say is uh, not so easy uh, to ending, uh, you know, the one uh, epidemic. And currently there is a very big debate, uh, you know, uh, regarding the merits of lockdown. So uh, uh, one, you know, kind of uh, the uh, suggestion from an experts group are Great Britain declaration, they call. They propose that a new strategy to combat COVID because uh, they say that the lockdown uh, gives us so much, you know, direct and indirect negative effect uh, in short term and long term. So uh, they propose that the minimizing mortality and social harm until reaching herd immunity, but uh, providing the focused protection by protecting high risk groups and ease restriction on low risk groups to establish immunity. But other experts groups really kind of against this uh, declaration and they made a kind of John Snow memorandum. And they said that the, you know, the lockdowns are initially very necessary to reduce mortality and protect the healthcare and natural herd immunity would not be happening. And uh, nowadays, you know, a lot of uh, kind of evidence shows that. So there are kind of debates. So uh, what I want to say is there's no kind of perfect answer. And each country, you know, every country has have this kind of debate, even between experts. So it is not only, you know, Japan uh, as exception. You also have a variety of debate, I understand. But uh, you don't have uh, so many experts, so there there is not so maybe big debates. But um, even you know Sweden, UK, US, there are a lot of kind of this kind of debates. So uh, you know what kind of effort to end COVID nineteen? You know, important one is compliance, not just on only measures. Uh, I, I've observed that in Japan there is big debates or kind of uh, um, criticisms on uh, uh, government measures, but important one is not measure or strictness of uh, you know, political measures or policy, but the more important one is compliance or uh, responsiveness of uh, you know, the people with the effective measures. So most of the countries you know, observing second or third wave of uh, epidemic are the countries poor compliance, I can say. So, uh, you know, my friends in uh, France, UK and others, they said, ah, oh, people are, you know, going just very much easy and, you know, wearing, uh, without wearing masks, they are really kind of, um, you know, the noise and um, really had a big uh, Christmas party and others. Uh, could you imagine in European countries, uh, 
kind of ease that um, uh, restriction on the day of uh, Christmas Eve or year, uh, Eve. So uh, even in Switzerland, the, until the 1 a.m. of midnight of uh, year, the first year, you know, uh, they had a party in, uh, inside or outside of the uh, houses. So they have to be a bit kind of generous sometimes because, uh, you know, the people could not, uh, you know, the, the stay home at home. And sometimes they really kind of um, explode uh, because of, uh, you know, that uh, limiting their kind of uh, the mobility. So, but, you know, um, this compliance is very, very, very hard. Uh, that is why maybe you need a kind of differentiated approach or some countries they call the tier approach. So uh, between high risks and low risks and, uh, you know, hammer and dance kind of approach is also very much needed, but maybe kind of lockdown as a last resort. Um, and also, of course, in the treatment and quality of care is very, very critical to increase the survival rate. And, uh, but I want to emphasize that COVID-19 is not uh, uh, only pathogen to affect people. There are a variety of you know, more pathogens, diseases, and not only just communicable diseases, but also non-communicable diseases and even mental, you know, the stress and the illnesses. So, um, of course, you know, important to end this COVID-19, but we need a more kind of comprehensive uh, wave of uh, approaches, how to just deal with variety of, you know, the uh, diseases and how to also, uh, you know, make a big, good balance between this, uh, you know, social and, uh, you know, economic uh, issues and also public health issues. That is why, you know, uh, we really need to look at kind of a data uh, and evidence and uh, we can utilize, you know, the uh, additional new evidence for, you know, better integration uh, and an innovative kind of way of working. Okay, I want to stop there. And thank you very much for listening and I welcome your question or comments. Thank you very much, Dr. Kuni. It was very comprehensive, very in-depth uh, in regarding this COVID-19 and also other uh, pathogen effort that the Global Funding is, is trying to uh, tackle. Um, I'm sorry for the some technical uh, difficulty in the very beginning so that some of the participants could not attend. Um, so I will make this video available after um, a couple of days so that you can all watch the entire uh, presentation of Dr. Kuni. So don't worry, I will let uh, everybody know the link. And uh, also, um, because you missed the first instruction, so if you have any questions, please send through this Q&A column on the bottom of the screen so that uh, we can um, pick each one of questions now. Uh, since because we have a time constraint, is it okay to extend a little bit of time, Dr. Kuni? Okay. Yes. So, uh, okay. So let's uh, take uh, one first question here uh, from Mayu. Um, she says, I would really appreciate it if I could ask question around one, local manufacturing in sub-Saharan Africa, two, shortage of PPE in SSA, and third, potential collaboration with IOC upstream team. Sure. Uh, Sorry, she wants I, to elaborate. Um, okay. Sorry, I can't listen to a second question. I understand the first uh, question. Second but, question is shortage yeah. of PPE and SSA. Yeah. Okay. So can I respond? Uh, yeah, nowadays many countries now uh, start uh, manufacturing uh, PPE, especially the uh, masks and some of the, uh, you know, the uh, clothes. But as you know, uh, especially masks, uh, we need uh, quality control because uh, as you see that the effectiveness uh, efficacy of the masks are quite different, uh, you know, based on that uh, the materials and uh, structure. So uh, uh, we really need to, you know, uh, have a kind of standardization or kind of quality assurance, but they are uh, kind of uh, 
increasing the kind of locations and the manufacturers of uh, this manufacturing PPE in sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, some of the you know, private sectors also supporting that kind of things. Okay, any qu other question? Okay. Um... Ah, and I can say, uh, you know, the ventilators, artificial ventilators, if you buy, a uh, nice one, it costs a lot, you know, huge amount of money, more than 20,000 US dollar. But now these uh, 3D printing or kind of open source uh, kind of, uh, you know, the support for manufacturing uh, the ventilators, very, very simple ventilators. They are also uh, used in uh, African countries as well. I just want to add. Okay, so Mayu, do you want to elaborate a little bit more? Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, um, uh, I think my uh, point short as a PPP is uh, like, you know, Nigerian doctors left Nigeria for UK due to the shortage of PPE in Nigeria. So, you know, this issue will worsen the shortage of medical staff uh, in African countries in the, you know, long term run. So, um, yeah. From that perspective, uh, I ask the second point. And the first point is uh, local manufacturing. Um, COVID-19 reveals the uh, securities of countries like uh, local pharmaceutical manufacturing. However, there are you know, some issues around the local manufacturing in sub-Saharan Africa. For instance, in anti-retroviral space, top API suppliers control the market. And without the relationship with them, no one can play in the space. So uh, I understand the Global Fund uh, started to offer some incentives for local manufacturers um, a couple of years ago. So could you elaborate the local manufacturing incentives, how those will you know, support local manufacturing, both API production model and mixed input model? Uh, does the local manufacturing point. And the last point, potential collaboration with the ISC. Um, ISC has recently established an upstream unit of its developed market creation type project and bankable you know, investment projects. And the current project include COVID-19 testing, mobile clinic expansion. So um, um, I'd like to understand, you know, whether is it, you know, there's opportunity to, you know, discuss further. Uh, with the ISC upstream, um, you know, between the global global fund and the uh, ISC upstream team. Uh, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Maybe you you can send me a kind of a personal email, and maybe you can set the kind of meeting uh, for that purpose in the second one. And um, yeah, actually, you know, the local manufacturing, uh, we are not supporting financially, but. Uh, uh, because there are many other uh, private sectors and the agencies who are kind of interested to support, but uh, not the Global Fund directly. But uh, we feel it is quite important for, you know, the countries uh, in countries, especially the middle income countries, uh, to, to increase the, their capacity of uh, local manufacturing. But uh, before that, actually that the quality assurance is more important for, for us, uh, global funds especially, because ART and uh, you know, the ultimate uh, combination therapy and et cetera, we, because uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, the, re uh, the resistance to those uh, uh, medicines. That is why we really need to control that uh, you know, resistance. So kind of uh, fit uh, drugs or low quality medicine will be uh, really kind of uh, troublesome. But uh, uh, nowadays, uh, you know, there are several, for example, Nigeria is a really kind of a big country and uh, quite um, uh, high standard of um, uh, manufacturers or um, that the te technologies are available there. So maybe it might be possible um, uh, for Nigeria or South Africa or maybe Kenya uh, to set um, some of the manufacturing of APA or other uh, kind of substance. Maybe I, I want to stop here and maybe we can discuss uh, uh, later much more kind of detail. Any other question? 
Any other question? You can um, send us a, a question through this uh, Q&A column if you have it. Otherwise, I have a question to Dr. Kuni. Um, as you have laid out, uh, you know, the cooperative uh, uh, effort by various uh, actors, organizations, um, you know, because U.S. is absent from this, you know, COVAX uh, facility and maybe not have been so present for the past years because of Mr. Trump's attitude. And I, I hope that the U.S. will be back, you know, if Mr. Biden comes uh, into power, but we don't see clear leadership in this uh, global community. And with that situation, um, who will be, who be leading this, you know, all the multilateral effort? Well, without having any clear leader, are we able to still continue this, um, you know, multilateral effort successfully? I appreciate your yeah, comment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, it's quite difficult to say um, the leadership, because this is kind of partnership and uh, uh, there are a variety of uh, steps and the processes we have to, uh, you know, make in this kind of, uh, you know, uh, global uh, collaboration. So, for example, setting a kind of um, uh, standard or um, the pre-qualification kind of a review and etc. Uh, we really have to uh, involve WHO. So WHO is kind of leaders of a technical kind of guidance or norm setting, okay? And uh, facilitating that um, uh, R&T, stimulating R&T would be a private sector actually. That, and uh, maybe US could be also supporting financially and technically, but um, uh, even Germany, uh, France and UK uh, also have a quite good manufacturers and also an expert on that one. So uh, they can work together for R&D. And uh, procurement may be better uh, for UNICEF uh, and the WFP the Global Fund uh, work together uh, for rapid you know, procurement and distribution to the last mile. And the training Again, the WHO needs to provide uh, guidance for training. So, you know, variety of, uh, you know, steps we need. And uh, of course, World Bank also needs to be stepping in uh, for innovative financing, etc. cetera. So uh, uh, actually there are a lot of, um, you know, roles and functions uh, and the leadership and management needed in this kind of a big one. Uh, but I observed that, uh, you know, this kind of uh, uh, innovative collaboration is very much needed. But finally, each e agency's capability and capacities are very, very critical. Because if, you know, each of the you know, agencies have a very limited capacity and limited uh, uh, capability, maybe it is quite difficult to drive uh, kind of big movement and also uh, uh, the, uh, achieving the target. That is why, uh, for example, Global Fund, we you make most of our own resources for ACTA. And uh, finally, we need to contribute uh, you know, our uh, capability to this ACTA. So uh, maybe each agency needs to bring uh, you know, their own um, the added value and also comparative advantage to this kind of uh, the, uh, organization. U.S.'s role would be very important, technically and financially. They have a quite good expertise in CDC, USAID, PEPFAR, etc. Uh, but uh, because of this, uh, you know, the WHO issues, they uh, haven't uh, attended many of the technical uh, kind of a, a meeting uh, in the past, especially uh, the you know WHO related one. But I hope uh, you know they will be back back soon. And we are now discussing with a new administration for uh, better financing for this uh, COVID one. 
Okay, thank you. So we don't have a more question. Is Ms. Uh, Dr. Kurokawa, would you like to uh, uh, give us your view or they uh, ask questions to Dr. Kuni? Dr. Kurokawa? Dr. Kurokawa? <laughs> May not be here. Um, there's a, uh, one more question actually uh, coming through. Uh, previously, uh, the person who sent us a, a question she said that, you know, as you said, there are uh, all nations around the world having difficulty just dealing with domestic uh, problem already, and they don't have really a capacity to, to look for other nations. So is there any uh, things that individual citizens can do in order to help this uh, collaborative effort to, to tackle this COVID-19? Yeah, um, of course, you know, depending on that, the individuals, um, interest and also capacity, expertise, etc. But you know, you can see this time that civic tech is uh, quite uh, important, and um, some of the civil uh, societies, especially with the expertise of uh, I ICT, supported the variety of things like uh, you know designing 3D printing for the artificial uh, these ventilators, and also uh, uh, supporting that uh, uh, info. Um, infographics, uh, analysis and synthesis and the visualization of data. Uh, so, you know, Johns Hopkins and other, you know, mass media, even some of the individuals, you know, contributed uh, making that kind of a visualization of infographics and etc. And uh, uh, Code for Japan, uh, that kind of society is also supporting uh, that uh, generating that the good infographics for you know Japan's COVID situation, and uh, some of the expertise also provided the uh, data and the information of uh, uh, the uh, uh, mutation, so that uh, uh, you know that uh, yeah there is uh, some uh, platform to provide all kind of a mutation, uh, so that you know they can show that the, you know the uh, uh, the change of the um, that uh, genetic codes um, to uh, you know and share those information with uh, other experts. So there are a variety of um, you know things you can do, and of course you know that uh, writing report and also paper, scientific paper, uh, also gives a good contribution to other uh, experts and other people. Uh, for uh, generating that evidence and experience sharing. And also you can give donation. Uh, I'm also uh, kind of supporting the, some of the uh, donation um, and also providing that to um, uh, medical facilities suffering from uh, this COVID and others. So uh, maybe even your uh, small donation would be helping to others who are suffering from, uh, uh, you know, job loss and uh, others. Uh, Dr. Kunisan, Kunisan. Hi. Yes. Thank you very much for your very clearly, clearly described COVID one thing. Uh, my argument is COVID one, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, become a pandemic so that in this connected world we can learn and share a, a response of each country and just navigate so that we could be really uh, sharing what we can do and second one is i think even there's a sort of vaccine vaccine happening and a, and a sort of production when is it available and this is completely different from hiv that time like vaccine or let's say malaria and others because all the rich countries are affected by covid too so i'm sure they're going to sort of uh, prioritize their vaccine available to their own people so how to 
Can I clarify the question? First one is a connect, uh, kind of a right. contribution from uh, each countries. Yes. Second one is a kind of vaccine production or distribution to uh, low income countries. Because availability of vaccine availability. is limited in the area phase yes. anyway. Yeah, yeah. And this is different from other, let's say, malaria and others. And and also which countries also people are affected by. So how to prioritize and share this vaccine? That's uh -huh. Question. Okay, vaccine of a uh, COVID, right? COVID vaccine. Yes. Okay, okay. Right. Yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, um, first question, contribution. Uh, you know, variety of contribution uh, each country can do, uh, of course, uh, uh, based on their own capacity and, uh, you know, whatever. For example, China, <laughs> maybe there is a lot of kind of argument there, but they provided, uh, you know, the kind of... Um, the information initially that the code of uh, you know all genetic codes and uh, also they uh, contribute a lot about the evidence uh, you know a lot of uh, ep epidemiological study among you know the patients and other you know uh, the data are also shared in the world and other countries also a g8 countries also provide a lot of uh, you know such kind of data and information so uh, you know to kind of uh, in um, the such kind of uh, uh, information sharing and also kind of a discussion would be very, very critical. And uh, uh, of course, some of the, you know, the packaging of uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions and that effect also uh, would be also quite uh, important for, for others. And of course, R&D that, that, you know, the developing uh, new medicines, diagnostics and uh, vaccines are also uh, very, very important for the global contribution of course, and the monetary contribution, as I said, also uh, uh, quite critical, especially from rich countries to uh, low-income countries to support. Technical support uh, also, of course, that, uh, you know, especially low-income uh, countries have uh, uh, quite a um, the lack of um, the such kind of techno uh, technology and also technical kind of knowledge to do. So, um, uh, yeah, a lot of, uh, you know, contribution could be done to, to each other. Um, I also feel the importance of a regional or collaboration or regional kind of a, a hub, like, uh, you know, this time European CDC and African CDC uh, contribute a lot because, you know, each country are, you know, kind of suffering and could not go beyond, but, uh, you know, regional uh, uh, office or agencies could coordinate among those and the region is quite good because, uh, you know, situation is quite different from country to country, but quite similar in the region. So, uh, uh, you know, EU, that the European CDC uh, really helped a lot for information sharing, et cetera, there. And uh, African CDCs, yes. And I kind of propose, you know, in uh, Eastern Asia, also maybe you, Japan, Korea, uh, China, Taiwan. Uh, nowadays, you know, Thailand also has a quite a good, uh, you know, public health knowledge and etc. So uh, maybe you can have uh, some good networking among that expertise and the others uh, in uh, Eastern Euro uh, Eastern uh, Asia, so that you can also uh, kind of uh, analyze that some of the success and the lessons of uh, this COVID, and maybe utilize those for the future pandemic. Second question. Um, that, uh, yeah, I already mentioned in my, uh, you know, slides, variety of kind of allocation methodologies. As I said, that current, uh, you know, limited uh, the vaccine would be shared to all the countries uh, who are belonging to COVAX that uh, initially the first phase is the 3% of the population, okay, population, main, mainly targeting the frontline health workers and maybe elderly. And uh, you know, gradually, you know, just increasing that the priority. That is why each country uh, has to set the priority for this immunization. And um, yeah, but uh, this kind of uh, proportional allocation is uh, now uh, under kind of debate. 
because uh, you know recent it is a, a Lancet or a BMJ a, just argued better not to give uh, you know this allocation proportionally, but more the need that uh, consideration of um, a premature death and the disease burden and um, ability to pay the GNI. Actually, you know, we Global Fund, we also have an allocation methodology based on two principles. One is ability to pay. So uh, the, the countries who do not, which cannot pay, uh, get more money. And other one is disease burden. The bigger burden countries get more allocation. So, and, and of course we need some adjustment by key populations uh, or, you know, kind of variety of, uh, you know, that factors uh, to be considered or adjusted. But the mainly we use two, you know, kind of indicators. So maybe in this COVID one, I also quite agree. If, uh, personally, I agree that, uh, you know, premature death and the disease burden of COVID with, and also ability to pay. These are three are quite important for consideration. But of course, this is a, a COVAX and uh, uh, I'm not involved in this kind of allocation methodology. So I just want to leave it there. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we went to over time and I just want to thank Dr. Kuni and uh, everybody who participated today. I very much thank you for your time and we will make uh, this video available as soon as possible. And I hope that uh, you will join for the next session as well. We are planning a next session on January 26, inviting uh, Dr. Sanjaya from Australia. He's gonna tell us about Australian approach, how they uh, deal with the um, COVID-19. So, I will send the information around and thank you very much for participation. Thank you very much, Dr. Kuni, for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.